Greetings. Thank you for joining us today. There's been a lot in the news recently about uh, ambulances and uh, nurses and the strikes that are going on. And they're going on for good reason. Uh, they're going on for good reason because they want to defend the NHS. It's worth defending. Now, many folk never get the chance to venture abroad and see what services are like in other countries. But I have. And my family and I have. And uh, for, for a while we lived in the States. And we had good experiences there and, uh, and bad experiences. Uh, more bad than anything else, to be honest. Um, out there, of course, they don't have a national health service. It's not in any way centralised or organised. And you have to go and fend for yourself for the most part. The idea is you, you pay for a high priced insurance, which covers somewhat of the basics. And then you pay uh, for every doctor's visit. Every time you buy some pills, you pay and pay and pay and pay some more. Yeah. And if you visit a hospital, they're not all the same, but if you visit some hospitals, uh, you might think, oh, I'll go out there, I'll get have an operation, one operation, for example, I have your appendix out, you know. And uh, now in some UK private hospitals, they will quote you a price, you know, there's your price, that's what you pay, and that's it. And it's all in one price quote. It's fairly straightforward. Not in all U USA hospitals, no. Not some American hospitals like to bill you department by department, uh, further complicating what is a stressful situation. Uh, so you could find yourself in an American uh, a &E or yeah, and uh, with some unknown illness, and every department bills you. So you come out of there not only fighting an illness, but also fighting 15 different bills from different directions. Marvellous. Well, back to the UK. Um, uh, of course, we've seen the Prime Minister's question time and uh, Keir Starmer uh, towing up to the Prime Minister about the waiting times for ambulances. And they're getting longer and longer to, to the point where, really, if you need an ambulance, frankly, you're better off getting a taxi. The, uh, the idea is, of course, that we have a service that, that's quick, available, and can get to your to hospital if you have a, a broken limb, uh, some threat to your life, you know, a, a, I don't know, symptoms of a heart attack. It's there pretty quickly and it takes you to hospital to be treated. Uh, but they've been pushing the service and pushing the service and making cuts, cuts upon cuts. And now we're looking at, ooh, if you're lucky, 40 minute wait, but more realistically, several hours wait for an ambulance. So somebody who suddenly suffers from, uh, I don't know, chest pains, yeah, they could die before the ambulance gets to them. Now you call 999 or um, one of the other numbers to try and get uh, help. And of course, they'll run through a diagnosis to try and work out how serious it is for you. Uh, but still, you are still facing a wait. Now, there are people, of course, who don't need an ambulance. And for those, well, there's your local GP. There's assistance at pharmacy. There's a whole range of assistance available. But... We still need the ambulance service. Now, thinking about a, a time not so long ago where I was in an accident, a uh, cycling accident, and I, uh, I ended up with a broken nose. So I was out in the middle of Wolverhampton and an ambulance was called because, um, frankly, I needed it. I was concussed with a broken nose. And, and mercifully, the ambulance was quite close. But it was while I was being treated by the ambulance staff and having a, a brief ride to the hospital for further investigations, that was when they told me exactly how far this particular ambulance travels. Now, I thought to myself, well, well an ambulance doesn't go that far. You've got to be, you know, available within 20 minutes or possibly less. So you think, well, maybe the ambulance just serves Wolverhampton. Not so. Not so at all. The one ambulance I was being treated by uh, they go as far as Stoke-on-Trent in one direction and as far as Solihull in the other direction. Um, each of those, well, it's a good 20, 30 miles to Solihull from Wolverhampton and uh, it's another 40, 50 to get to Stoke. Um, maybe not so far depending on where you go, but all the same, it's a massive catchment area. And when you inc and we include in that catchment area most of Birmingham, Stoke-on-Trent and Wolverhampton, and Soli Hall, really, just a couple of ambulances to service that. 
Now, I've no idea how many there are, but you can bet there aren't many. There aren't enough. We need more. But what do we have a lot of in the NHS? Well, we have long waiting times and a lot of managers. Managers, managers, uh, a lot of outsourcing. Uh, money is thrown, uh, thrown at temp agencies when really it would be cheaper to have people uh, employed in-house. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of efficiencies that could be made, but they could be made by cutting private, uh, private enterprise right out of the uh, services we uh, love so dearly. More recently than that, uh, my son was unfortunate enough to, one of my sons was unfortunate enough to have an accident whilst out one night and he, he twisted, as is easy to do, twisted and, and uh, busted his knee up. Um, he came down like a, a bunch of broken twigs on the dance floor that he was dancing around on at the time. What he'd actually done was twisted so his knee, kneecap had shifted to one side and back again very quickly causing quite a bit of damage in the process. Now at that stage uh, he did what anyone would do and, and uh, to get outside the club, get off the dance floor of course and, and uh, go and call the ambulance, call emergency services, see what could be done. Now they were not keen to help and they suggested he get someone to get him to uh, the A&E where he could be maybe checked out or maybe see his GP. Now his knee was swelling up quite a lot at the time and he was in a lot of pain. So, you know, Payne being the driver here, he decided uh, to call home and um, I walked out to the club, mercifully it's not too far, and found him in a right sorry state outside. We called a taxi um, and uh, took him to our local uh, New Cross Hospital, which is the main Wolverhampton Hospital, and there um, took him to the accident and emergency, the A&E. That's where the waiting started. And we eventually spent uh, a good, ooh, I would say, 10, 12 hours in the hospital with him, waiting to be seen, just waiting to be seen. So when you first go in, you're, uh, you, you go to the reception, you tell them what you think's wrong, and they uh, put you in the queue to be seen by the triage nurse, who then has a look at you and establishes whether that's true or not, and works out the quickest form of uh, getting you treated. So they take one look at him, and decide to x-ray his knee. Seems sensible enough. And that was done pretty quickly. And they, uh, it wasn't too long before the x-ray was looked at and they said, well, we can't see any breaks, but it's probably worth seeing a real doctor, you know, to, to get a, a proper diagnosis, get some hands on the, the damaged knee. Well, we thought, well, how long could that really take? Well back into reception, we were told the wait was something like six to eight hours. <laughs> but then he was in a lot of pain and going nowhere, so we thought, well, we might as well wait here and see. Hopefully it's sooner, you know. He... And pigs might fly. So the hours tripped by, and eventually we're sent up to what they call urgent in-day care. Uh, which is just another form of the downstairs waiting room, frankly, with uh, harder seats, it would seem. And, and there we waited and waited and waited. And we could see the one doctor that was manning the, the accident and emergency that night. I didn't see any other doctors. Now they could be hanging around in the background, but I only saw the one. And we waited through this guy's entire shift as he treated lots of other people, working as fast as he could. But there were some very, very sick people in that waiting room. Some with horrible burns, some with chest pains, you name it. And we waited and waited and waited, clearly at the bottom of the list, um, unmedicated and in quite a lot of pain. Eventually we waited through the entirety of the shift until the next doctor uh, logged on for work, and at, at which point uh, my son was eventually seen and established, you know, that uh, yeah, he, he would need a crutch for a while and he ended up being seen by a specialist team and he's on the mend. But, uh, Seriously, 12 hours to get something diagnosed properly. 12 hours. You would expect on a Friday night, as it was, that uh, the A&E would be manned by, you know, several competent uh, doctors. That would get things sorted pretty quickly, wouldn't it? And to be fair, it, it's, a, it's a very minimum expectation. You expect a hospital to be staffed by doctors and nurses 
and uh, and, and you get seen quickly because right yeah busted knee it's not really that life-threatening but there was a whole lot of other people in that waiting room who were suffering from life-threatening uh, conditions you know the, the guy at the at the hour six mark some guy wanders over telling me oh you know i've got chest pains i, I, I don't want to wait around how long have you been waiting he says i said six hours <laughs> with the lad here he says oh yeah I'll be waiting about the same time but I can't wait around I'm going home people are going home while suffering what you might regard as life-threatening symptoms that's not cool not cool at all so I can't help feeling that the uh, the, uh, the end goal of the Tory is to wind down the NHS you know to not spend money on anything at all and uh, milk uh, milk all the poor people as best they can that that seems to be the end goal of these people they don't care because they 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 never have to use these services they never have to worry where their next meal is coming from and they're greedy it would not take a great deal to make the system work it wouldn't harm any rich any rich person to make the NHS work it doesn't need to be overmanaged and underfunded it needs to be properly funded the whole point of having a national health service is to take the burden of worrying how you'll recover away from this from the general population the whole idea is if you get sick you get treated a free at the point of delivery and then you go back out to work earn and you spend money again if you are having to worry about all the cost of your health care putting money aside for that maybe if you if you bought the ability then that money won't go into other businesses it won't be spent people won't buy the fancy cars they won't buy the the, the posh food they won't go out to drink they won't do things that they otherwise would feel free to do. They won't go on the holidays. They won't spend. And if they don't spend, the rich don't get richer. Because all that currency stays buried. Well, that's my two penneth. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you on the next one. Bye for now.